Your pool is probably a toxic hell stew. NASA has a 125 million mile house call to make, and uh, we're not talking to each other. Also, Mary Jo Foley is coming by to talk about Microsoft, journalism, and beer. It's all coming up next on Padres Corner. Geek in. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Padres Corner is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Padres Corner, episode four, recorded September 2nd, 2014. Beer with Mary Jo Foley. Welcome to Padres Corner. I'm Father Robert Ballas here, the digital Jesuit. Padres Corner is an experiment on Twit. It's a way for us to touch bases with our audience and to see what's important to the geek, to the gal, to the nerd, the dork, the, the person like me who just likes to geek out. Now, uh, Lisa and Leo got together a while back and they said, look, we've got a lot of shows that cover a lot of specific topics. We've got all about Android. We've got Windows Weekly. We've got Mac Break. We've got a show to cover every nerdy topic. But what about all those stories that fall between the cracks? What about all those stories that we don't have time for? What about those stories that are sort of tech related, but are really interesting for the geek inside us all. That's what Padre's all about, Padre's Corner. We put you into the mind of a geeky priest and see if you come out sane on the other side. Well, folks, why don't we go ahead and get straight into some freaking science. Now, uh, there's a report here from Scientific American talking a little bit about what we experience when we jump into a pool. Now, most of us think of pools during the summer as a place to relax, a place to, to chill out, a place to unwind, a place where families can gather and people can have fun. But Scientific American also says that it may actually be chemical warfare. According to a report that was put out by the Water Quality and Health Council back in 2009, one in five people admitted to peeing in the pool. Four out of five people strongly suspected that their fellow swimmers were peeing in the pool, and three in five people were lying about not peeing in the pool. That last part was actually my extrapolation of the data. There are, there are a lot of reasons why people will pee in the pool. Children who don't know better or adults who have an emergency or who are just too lazy or maybe they don't want to use the public facilities. And then there's just those people who aren't nice human beings and who don't, don't care about their health or the health of their fellow swimmers. But the biggest reason I believe that people... Uh, pee in the pool is because they rightfully, rightfully believe that urine is sterile and therefore it will be harmless. They also believe that the pool is filled with chlorine. And chlorine, as we all know, is great at killing off bacteria, viruses, microorganisms. The problem is what happens to the urine once it gets into the pool. Again, from Scientific American, they've discovered that when you pee into a pool, it actually interacts with the chlorine. Now, for the most part, urine is sterile, and chlorine does kill bacteria and microorganisms, but chlorine also readily reacts with uric acid, the nitrogen-rich compound that gives urine its name and its smell. Now, when you combine chlorine with uric acid, you get cyanogen chloride and trichloramine. The presence of these compounds in pool water is suspected to increase the likelihood of various res respiratory problems. And it really doesn't take all that much to poison a pool. Sweat also increases the amount of uric acid available to react in a pool water, pool water supply. And a U.S. EPA study found that the levels of trichloramine rose by a factor of four after a typical swim meet, which means that it easily goes above the acceptable limit for that compound. Now, there are some steps that you can take. You uh, definitely don't want to swallow pool water. No. Seriously, I mean, we, we've all known this, but just don't do it. But you could also shower with soap before and after swimming. This not only removes that trichloramine from your body, but if you do it beforehand, it means that you're going to remove the sweat, which also is a big contributor to that uric acid. And the third part is, well, just don't pee in the pool. Now, just remember, the next time that you're relaxing in a pool, without a care in the world, your health and the health of those around you may be in your hands. Now let's go from some freaking science to, first, to some freaking engineering. 
Now, many of us have SSDs in our computers. In fact, I was just having a problem with a batch of Samsung SSDs that I had purchased over the last couple of years. I have about 30 of them spread throughout my lab and the various computers I run in my lab. And, uh, well, SSDs are great because they're incredibly fast, because we, we love how, how much performance they can give to our computers. But SSDs need TLC, tender loving care, just like a hard drive. Now, that ongoing problem I've had with that batch of Samsung SSDs deals with the loss of performance over time. They were blazing fast when I first purchased them, but recently, even with Samsung's own diagnostics, I found that the read and write speed is less than half of what it was when I first installed them. The problem comes from the way that flash memory works. A flash memory cell can be read an infinite number of times, but it can only be written to a finite number of times. The reason for that is the way that a flash cell, the, the individual component of a SSD, is constructed. It's basically a capacitor, and the capacitor has insulation. And in order to change the state of that cell, you need to push enough voltage through the insulation in order to affect the cell. Now, over time, that pushing through a voltage will degrade the insulation so that the cell is no longer readable. Instead of getting an on or an off state, you get something in the middle, and that's just no good. Now, there are a couple of things that you can do to fix that. You can reformat the drive. You can run a utility that will mark the bad sectors as bad so that, uh, well, it kind of recharges the cells, giving you back that one and that zero. But uh, formatting has always been the nuclear option to get rid of bugs, glitches, and bloat that our desktops pick up. It's an absolute pain, especially when you have to uh, reinstall all your software, when you have to change all your settings, when you have to update after update after update to get your computer up to date. Now, the first sign of the problem is the slowdown, but the next sign would be a loss of data, which absolutely is not acceptable. Now, this, this is bad. You and I would both agree that this is bad, but what if you had an SSD that started acting up and it was 125 million miles away from you. That's exactly what's happen happening to NASA and the JPL team right now. They've got a rover, the Opportunity rover, that in the next month they'll have to reformat. The Opportunity rover has been dealing with an increasing number of glitchy errors in its mission computer over these past few months. In the last month alone, the computer has reset itself because of corrupted SSD memory about a dozen times. Now, in the past five years, we've perfected wear leveling, which mitigates that whole wearing down of the flash memory cell. But unfortunately, since the opportunity was launched a decade ago, it just doesn't have that technology. They're finding out that the cells are wearing unevenly, and because data is being written to bad cells, well, they're getting errors. In order to correct this, they're going to reformat the opportunity. Now, this is, uh, it, it's not as dangerous as it sounds. They're going to reformat the flash memory. This should allow the controller to mark the bad memory cells. And in the future, this should keep the rover from writing to those cells and triggering the resets. Now, the NASA will download all the remaining data in opportunity's memory, and the operational software is stored in a different flash storage array on the rover, so there's not any, you know, uh, problem of bricking the rover. That flash memory isn't damaged, the one holding the operational memory, because it only reads, it doesn't write. The rover will continue to communicate with NASA during the process, but the slower speed will ensure an uncorrupted reformatting of the drive. So the next time you're frustrated by a system reset, just remember it could be worse. Your house call could be 125 million miles away. Now, I'm starting to feel a rant coming on, but before we go there, why don't we take some time to listen to Steve Gibson, who uh, might just explain what Spinrite could have done to save the rover. Someone told me that the throughput issue I was having with some of my uh, um, older Samsung SSDs could be solved by running Spinrite in level two. And I, I was thinking in the back of my head, I'm like, this is ridiculous, it's an SSD, it's not a rotating drive, that's stupid. I ran it and it, by golly, it worked. I, how <laughs> does this work? What magic did you bake into Spinrite to, to revive SSDs? Essentially, the, the technology of SSD is like dynamic RAM, where the in order to get the, the bits small enough, dynamic RAM uses capacitors to store the, the, the bits as ones and zeros. Just it uses electrostatic charge. And 
that tends to bleed off over time just due to leakage because the cells are so small, the capacitance isn't large enough. And that's why you have to do so-called refreshing of dynamic RAM. You've got to come back and read it before it's bled all out, before the data has sort of leaked away to a point where you can no longer differentiate the ones and the zeros. Freaky as it sounds, that's the same technology as in SSDs. It's a much slower leakage, but it's still doing that. And, and so it, it actually, an SSD is just a huge plantation of little capacitors where charge is essentially stranded out on a plateau and um, a field effect transistor is able to sense the field, the electrostatic field created by that charge. But over time, they, the, these cells weaken. And, and the important thing to understand is that if we only need, if engineers only needed to make a, you know, a 1K SSD, oh my God, it would be bulletproof, absolutely reliable. We could do that because with so few bits, the bits could be so large that they could be reliable. But the engineers have pushed them so far that they're operating more in an analog fashion, not such, not just one and zero, but somewhere between one and zero. So what Spinrite is able to do is it's able to turn off by talking to the drive. It turns off some of the, the sort of, oh, don't worry about this. We'll take care of it stuff in order to show the drive when it has a problem which you would otherwise ignore. Essentially, what Spinrite does is it allows the SSD to be more picky. And instead of being lazy and using error correction to fix the sector which is becoming weak and taking more time, it says, no, let's, like right now, let's fix this. And so the SSD rewrites that sector which was, which was using error correction so that it no longer needs it, which then speeds up the execution in the future. See, now, now that you say it, it makes so much sense. You know, rather than the <laughs> drive trying to fix the errors on the fly as it's reading and writing, right, Spinrite right. just goes in and says, you know what, I'm going to fix everything for you and you're golden. And, and that right. means I, that's, that it would explain why suddenly I get all my, my performance back. It, it wasn't necessarily that the, the drive was damaged. It's just that the drive was busy, but because the way that flash drive, uh, SSD right. drives work, it didn't want to do all that that maintenance because in doing that, it's actually wearing itself out. I, I like that. That's right. fantastic. It just it just wanted to defer that. Hey NASA, I think we actually have a solution for your little rover problem. His name is Steve Gibson. Either that, or as the chat room is suggesting, we could just ask Mark Watney to stop by the opportunity and give it a kick. Now. This is normally the time when I start a rant, but the problem is this last week there has been a lot of rantable material. I could talk a little bit about politicians who have recently been discovered to be getting payoffs from Comcast during the Comcast and Time Warner merger attempt, which is strange because those same politicians have been suddenly very supportive of the Comcast-Time Warner merger. But that's a little too easy. Maybe we'll talk about that in a couple of weeks. I could also talk about the righteous indignation that has exploded over this last weekend over the nude gate, the release of nude photos and, and scanty photos from, from certain celebrities' cloud-stored data files. Uh, now, I, I could talk about that. I could also talk about how that righteous indignation has, has squelched a much larger and what I think is a much more productive conversation about the fact that there's a lot of people in this world who don't understand the very basic technologies that they're using. But instead of that, I want to do something that's a little less ranty, something that's a little less angry, maybe something that I think could be more of a discussion between myself and the chat room and the people who watch the show than just a straightforward, this is something that I think is bad. What I want to talk about is the rise of the troll society. Now, oh, what, what do I mean by that? Let, let me give you a couple of examples. This last week, we've seen some major problems in the formerly friendly skies. You've probably heard about the last nine days, the rash of uh, it, 
events happening when people freak out, rage out when they don't get their, uh, their, their knee room because of reclining seats. Nine days ago, it was two passengers on a United flight who got into it because one passenger installed knee defenders on the seat in front of him, preventing the woman in that seat from reclining. Well, the female passenger complained. A flight attendant told the man that it was unlawful to interfere with the operation of a seat. The man ignored the attendant. Then the woman threw a glass of water at him. The plane had to divert to Chicago, and both the passengers were taken off and interviewed and then released. Well, that, that was strange, and we talked about it, and we talked about whether or not it was right for someone to take up the room, the, 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 the kneeling room behind them. But then a few days later, there was another story about another flight. This time, it was an American Airlines flight from Paris to Miami. A French passenger became upset when the woman in front of him reclined her seat. Now, he argued with one of the flight crew, and he was told that, well, it's not illegal for her to recline. So he followed the crewman down the aisle and grabbed his arm. Well, two flight marshals who were on the flight grabbed him, subdued him, then cuffed him. And the plane diverted to Boston, and the passengers were taken off. Now, again, this, this is sort of strange, but it, it's not unusual. We've heard of air rage before. When you take people and you put them in a confined space, of course, they're going to be a little stressed out. Now, just yesterday, we heard yet another case. This time, it was a Delta Airlines flight from New York to Florida that had to be diverted to Jacksonville. A passenger was sleeping with her head on the tray when the woman in front of her reclined her chair. The passenger started screaming and swearing because evidently the, the seat bonked her on the head, and she demanded that the plane land. The attendants tried to calm her down, but in her words, as, as reported by her fellow passengers, she said, I don't care about the consequences. Put this plane down now. Well, the pilot, out of an abundance of caution, did land the plane. She did get out at Jacksonville. She was interviewed, then released. Now, it would be easy, very easy, to look at all of these incidents and say, it's just normal. This, this is totally normal. People get upset, especially when you pack them together, especially when you make them travel. Traveling is one of the most stressful experiences that we have as humans. But I think that's the easy way out. I think that's the, the, the too easy explanation of something that may be far more complicated and far more notorious of our attention. I think that we've forgotten how to talk to one another. Now, now hold on. Before, before you jump to conclusions, before you call me crazy, because you can do that later on, hear me out. In each case, two passengers had a disagreement and immediately resorted to yelling, to screaming, and physical violence. There was no attempt at a conversation about what was fair. There was no give and take leading to a compromise. There was, no, there was instead an assertion of, this is my right, this is what I'm entitled to do, and therefore you are in the wrong from, from both sets of passengers. And when that wasn't honored, violence ensued. Now, this, this isn't new. I'm not saying that this is a, a new phenomenon, that this is only happening now, that this, this is you know, something that's occurring within the last two, three, ten years. There's always been conflict within, whenever humans have a conflict over resources. But this feels a little bit different. I think that maybe, maybe we may be seeing one of the consequences of the Internet generation. Okay, now, don't get me wrong. I think the internet is a fantastic platform for the free sharing of ideas. I think that it's a, a way to bypass the traditional media filters. I think that the synchronous exchange of content is an ideal thing to have in the world. But I also, and I also believe that anonymity is a big part of what makes the internet so socially disruptive. And I mean that in a good way. I in no way, shape, or form believe that we should place blame on the internet. I don't think we should demonize it. I don't think that we should get rid of it. I don't think that we should, we should regulate it. I don't think we should, limit, should uh, tell people what they can and cannot do on the internet. But instead, I think we should all take a step back and look at what it's doing to us and what it's doing to the way that we relate with other people. The danger of such ubiquitous, unrestrained, anonymous communication is that we've started to spend more time talking at people than with them. Again, this is a, this is a major generalization. Uh, you could say this about many different parts uh, of uh, many different eras in the history of, of humankind, but the internet has now enabled it to be so easy to do. 
I no longer have to have a, a conversation with someone. I can post. I no longer have to have an intelligent communication with someone. I can make a snarky comment. I no longer have to defend my views. I can be a troll. Now, let, let, let's step forward a little bit. Another example of this would be that today, the most popular gaming YouTuber on the planet, PewDiePie, announced his decision to turn off YouTube comments and leave them off. Now, he's starting to feel that YouTube comments are no longer fostering useful interaction with fans. Instead, he's going to turn to Twitter and to Reddit and hopefully moderate the communication so that he can get better interaction without what he calls the spam and the self-promotion and just the straight-up trolling. I think what PewDiePie is experiencing is just another example, a microcosm of that larger problem I spoke of before, which is we've forgotten how to speak to one another. We've forgotten what a polite conversation sounds like. We've forgotten how to properly make our arguments, how to properly defend ourselves to someone else, how to properly convince someone that maybe they could take our viewpoint. Instead, we have, as the internet generation, and I include myself in this, I do this all the time, we have reduced ourselves to the next witty comment. We've reduced ourselves to the next snarky tweet. We've reduced ourselves to the next bumper sticker piece of wisdom and forsaken deeper, more meaningful, more intelligent conversation. And it's not just the trolls and the spam and the haters and the flame wars. I think that we've all accepted this as normal. I mean, this is not just people who are on the internet. This is what this generation is doing. This is what we as a society have agreed to do. And I think it leaks out into the way that we look at complex social issues. I think as we look at things like conflicts around the world or the issues of privacy or whether or not the government should be in our business, just go down the list of all the current events from the last year or two. It's changed the way that we consider our rights, the way we consider ourselves, the way we consider our obligations to those around us have, I think, been lost, been forgotten, maybe changed for the worse. Now, I don't want to make this nostalgia. I'm not saying, back in our days, we had perfect communication, because we didn't. This, this, this internet thing is something that we're still sorting out. It's still something that we're, we're bringing to maturity. However, I think we have this wonderful opportunity, this, this teaching moment, this, this thing that I talk about a lot, this chance to actually form the same sort of communication that's forming us, to look at the way we communicate, to look at the way we relate with one another, ultimately to look at the way that we value one another and say, is this the best way to communicate? Is this the best way to debate? Is this the best way to have a conversation? I think if we figure out that part, then we'll be a little bit closer to what it means to be a truly connected society. That's the end of my rant, and now that means we get to my favorite part of the show when we bring our guest in. Ladies and gentlemen, I bring to you a woman who needs no introduction if you're a fan of the Twit TV network. It's Mary Jo Foley. Mary Jo Foley, thank you so much for coming on. I know it's late over there. Uh, I think I think when you uh, agreed to be on Padre's Corner, you, you, I, I not think I, I was honest about the time. Uh, so thank you for being with us. <laughs> I think you were honest, but I think I didn't do the mental math. Uh, you know, I, I don't do mental math uh, much either, so that's quite okay. Now, you're in New York right now. Uh, we were talking briefly before the show. It's crazy hot over there, right? I know. It is crazy hot right now. It, today it was 91 or 92. It's the, it was, Today was the hottest day of the summer in New York this year. Uh, wait, what? I know. Yep. It was actually a really beautiful summer here until... September. And now it's suddenly 90 with 80% humidity. It, it was just miserable today. You know, we're actually seeing that over here in San Francisco too. It's been mild the entire summer. In fact, uh, we do this retreat in Los Altos, which is also here in California, just down the peninsula a little bit. And it's always 95 to 100 degrees every day. I don't think we had a day over 75. So maybe wow. all the heat just stored up. I know. Maybe it's our penance for having a great summer. Okay. <laughs> now let's not talk about the weather. What we want to talk about is is about you. You have okay. long been a member of the Twit TV family, longer than I've been here. Uh, you're you're respected. You're well regarded. You you are our source for all things Microsoft. That's good to hear. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> 
<laughs> also, a, a woman, a few, a few words. She doesn't like to, to <laughs> toot her own horn. I understand this. But uh, let me back up a little bit. C can you tell us a little bit about where you came from? Because, uh, mm -hmm. you, you know, sometimes we see these these hosts on uh, on IPTV, on, on Twit TV, and we know what their specialty is. We know what they do. We know what they're, they're competent in. But we don't know much more beyond that. I, I know you're from Boston, but... How did you come to be the woman that you are today? Mm. A very confused and odd path, I would say, Padre. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I was born in Massachusetts, not far from where Paul Therat, my co-host, resides today. And uh, I grew up there. But uh, in between, I, I kind of traveled all over the U.S. And, and lived in many different cities in the U.S. and in the world. But all throughout that time, my passion was to be a writer. Ever since I was maybe, I'm not, I'm not exaggerating here, like five years old, I wanted to be a writer. When, when people would say to you as a kid, what do you want to be? I used to just say a writer. And I don't really know where that came from because neither of my parents were writers. So I, I'm not really sure where I came up with that. Now, when you talk about being a writer, did you want to be a fictional writer? Did, or do you just, you just wanted to write? I really didn't know. Um, hmm. it, it's funny. My mom reminds me of this a lot. She said one, one of my very early birthday presents when I was maybe like eight or nine, she gave me a plastic typewriter, but it was a typewriter that really worked. And the first thing I did was create a newspaper for our family with me and my brothers and sisters as the reporters. And we created it like on a, on a weekend basis and distributed it to my parents. So I don't know. There was some weird bug in my head from day one that I thought I wanted to be a journalist. And, and you have no idea where the bug came from. I mean, it wasn't. I really don't. It wasn't a journalist <laughs> that you'd, you'd read. It wasn't someone you saw on TV. It was just you had this deep seated desire to write stuff. Yeah, I, I think I didn't really know what journalists meant. Um, maybe I kind of was channeling Lois Lane. I don't know, but uh, <laughs> I really I don't know where that came from. And all I knew was throughout my like middle school, high school, college, I kept saying, you know, what? I want to be a writer, and I'm not really sure what that means or how what form that's going to take or where I'm going to end up. But that's what I want to do. Okay, so you want to be a writer. You 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 you've got this deep seated desire, even though you don't know where it comes from. <laughs> What do you do in order to make that happen? I mean, what, what, what did you did you go to journalism school? Did you did you major in it? Did, what sort of solid, concrete steps did you take in order to <laughs> to make that come true? Yeah, I did. I I ended up going to college in Boston at Simmons College, which which was an all women's college, and. Um, I majored in what was called communications, which was basically journalism. Although some some of the people in our, in my track also ended up going into PR, uh, so that I just kind of knew I want to do something in writing. I want to channel it that way, and I ended up having a really fantastic professor when I was in college who had who worked at the Boston Herald, which was one of the big newspapers at the time, and. He, I would say, his name was Alden Poole, and he was my mentor, basically. And I did whatever he told me to do as far as honing my career and specializing in journalism and figuring out how to go about becoming a journalist. He he is the one who kind of got me on the track. Um, I, I didn't really have a specialty. Like, I didn't know I wanted to be a tech journalist or a food journalist or whatever, but he just kind of guided me in learning the basics of what made somebody a good journalist. Uh, now, my brother did major in in uh, c uh, communications. He he thought he wanted to be a journalist, but he wasn't really sure what he wanted to do. I mean, he wasn't sure if he wanted to write. He wasn't sure if he wanted to be on the radio. He wasn't sure if he wanted to be on TV. You obviously had a clear inkling that you wanted to write, but mm -hmm. as you were going through your, your education, as you were going through college years and, and then your master's degree, uh, was were there certain cues that that started guiding you in one direction or another? Because writing, writing journalism, print journalism is actually huge. There's, there's such a huge uh, uh, range of fields that you can take within yeah. that heading. What was it that grabbed you? You know, I what's so funny now that the way our field has evolved, the parts I was l the least interested in were radio and TV. I kept thinking <laughs> that's the last thing I want to do. I can't, I can't even imagine doing those parts. I don't want to be the person who's facing the camera. I want to be the person writing the words for the people who face the camera. <laughs> so it's kind of ironic what's happened in our field now that everybody 
who is still in journalism, at least in the tech field, you kind of had to morph in your career and and hone yourself so that you can do a little bit of everything. But that is the last part I wanted. I really love the part of digging into a story, doing the research and writing it. And I didn't really care about the presenting of the story. Oh, okay. So you're a research addict. I, I've seen these people I before. You, you love getting to the yep. bottom of it. Uh, mm -hmm. tell, tell me a bit more about that. So when you're research, researching a story, what do you do? Uh, I, I am a different generation where yeah. typically I, I read stuff that people like you write. Uh, maybe mm -hmm. I'll extrapolate. Maybe I'll look for a, a couple of different sources. But the mm -hmm. true journalist, and there's very few true journalists anymore, can create a yeah. story out of out of nothing. It, it's like, for example, uh, uh, as a Jesuit, I will have to do multiple PhDs. And the whole idea behind a PhD mm -hmm. is to contribute knowledge that did not exist before, to add to the corpus something that wasn't mm -hmm. there. I think that's what a true journalist has to do on a daily basis. So how do you do it? Yeah. And, and, and you know what? We, we A few of us who are still in the field who are kind of like the dinosaurs, we talk about people these days don't really know what it means to break a story, right? And, and so many people think, you know, if somebody hands you a story like a PR department or a company, that's breaking a story. But the real way you break a story is people who you trust, who are your sources, they give you tips. And then you have to go, go out and kind of uh, verify the tips and put them in context. And that's a real dying art in our field, but a really valuable part of our field. So I, I feel like that's kind of where I fit into the picture now in tech journalism is people send me tips or they send me complaints or rants. And I try to figure out what they're talking about and how big a deal it is and and to go back and piece together what went wrong or what's going on or what kind, what kind of things are on a roadmap that haven't been disclosed. And I feel, I feel like that's my contribution. I, I'm good at connecting the dots and putting the pieces together. I, I think that may be the best description of the difference between a blogger and a journalist. And, and I, I'm not saying that blogger is not journalist, therefore is weak. I think they're just very, very different. Uh, a blogger can give context, but a blogger doesn't do all that much research. As, as you said, most bloggers will ha have a story that's written by someone else. They may combine it with facts from other stories that they've seen, and then they'll put it into their, their, their site, their whatever it is, that, how they reach their audience in a recontextualized way. But there still has to be that person who's searching for that nugget of truth. And I think here's, here's another difference between bloggers and journalists that I'd love to get your input on. Bloggers typically have to do multiple stories every day. True journalists can't mm. do that. And that's, I think, one of the things that has sort of killed off the field. If a journalist makes a fantastic story but can only do it once a month, he or she just doesn't make a living anymore, right? Yeah, it's it's funny. I, I don't really draw the blogger journalist line that way because when people ask me these days what I do, I say I'm a blogger. Mm. Um, to me, when you call yourself a blogger, it means that you're injecting your opinion in pieces that you write and that you're not pretending there's some unbiased truth. That's kind of how I define blogging. Um, but I know what you're talking about. You're talking about people who regurgitate stories that other people create and they don't have a lot of value add necessarily. And you're right. That is a tough place to be if you're the person generating the original content. You have to have a very solid financial backing, somebody who's who's allowing you to take the time to do the research. Um, I actually worked a while back for a publication where we got six months to write a tech story. And it was expected you were going to take the full six months to do the research, the writing, the vetting, the fact checking. And man, th those gigs are few and far between, especially in tech anymore. And I'm not saying just because you take a long time to do something, it means it's better. And in fact, that's that's actually not always true at all. But to have the luxury of the time where you can really dig into something and talk to multiple sources and, and talk to customers and partners and vendors, it really does make the story a lot more well-rounded. But these days, that's, that's a luxury very few of us have. Right. Right. Uh, who do you look up to? Uh, I, I can think of locally, we have the uh, San Jose Mercury News here. And mm -hmm. for my entire childhood, and actually most of my young adulthood, they were known as a uh, investigative outfit. That's what they did. They did hard reporting. They did hard journalism. 
it, it took a long time to develop, to develop stories, but every time they released a story, it was award-worthy. Recently, within the last 10 years, that's all gone. They just can't, they can't afford it anymore. They can't keep all those qualified journalists on staff. They can't keep giving people all that time to do reporting. And so now we're, we're at this point where most papers are just a regurgitation of the AP and other news sources. Do, do you lament that? Do you, do you see that as, oh, good times gone? Or is this just an evolution of your, of your trade? I think it's an evolution of our trade and not one I'm really all that happy about. But, I, you know, it's funny when, when you are asking, who do I look up to? Do I have kind of role models or whatever? I don't really think of things that way. I admire good stories when I read them and, and really respect that people can still find time and ways to generate those with all the pressures of page views and clickbait and all that. Um, but I don't really have people who I kind of idolize. I more just admire something good when I see it out in the field. Right, right. I, actually, I think that's that's a good way to do it. Uh, uh, let's let's take a step back because I, I don't want to let you off the hook about your uh, your journey <laughs> into tech journalism. I I heard somewhere that uh, your entree into tech journalism because remember we we know that you wanted to write you just didn't know what you were mm -hmm. going to write about was an accident. It was just luck of yep. the draw. It was. <laughs> It definitely was. That's that's not even a uh, hyperbole. I, I graduated from college and was applying for jobs and I was just kind of out there applying for anything and everything. I didn't really know where I'd end up. I knew I was going to have to come in at an entry level position once I got out of college. And so I applied. Um, one of the places I applied was a new startup magazine in the Boston area called Electronic Business that was a Connors publication. And uh I, I remember saying to them when I applied there, I don't know anything about tech. So if you guys hire me, you're going to have to train me. I, I literally know nothing. And they took me on anyway because they had let me do a writing test there while I was interning. Um, and they liked what they saw. They saw some potential, I guess. And so they said, yep, even though you know zero about tech, we're going to take you on and let you learn on the job. So it was very much an accident for me to get in. And uh, well, why did you stay in tech? I mean, that might have been why you got into it, but did did you find satisfaction in what you were writing? Because I mean, I, I know that you had a couple of different choices. You could have written for a travel magazine. You could mm -hmm. you could have gone into you know more news outlet type writing. But after you had this first break with a, with a tech outlet, you decided to stay. I did. You know, the, there's been some things that have kept me doing this. And I've been doing this more than 30 years now, which is kind of crazy to me that I stuck with it all that time. And I did a couple of times have ideas where maybe it was time for me to go. And I took some side diversions that almost took me out of the field. But the things I like about tech are, number one, even now, 30 years later, I feel like every day I learn something new. And I know that's not true of every job that you have in any field. Um, every day I, I feel like at the end of the day, wow, I learned X that I didn't know when I started today. And that's an awesome thing to get to have, the opportunity to learn all the time. I also get to interview like really legendary people in this field, even though I have never taken a computer science class or and I know nothing about programming. I've interviewed some really big names in tech and that's very humbling and awesome too because it makes you realize like, wow, there are these people out there and the more I interview them, the more I feel like I know what I don't know. And that's a great thing to me too. Um, and something that I feel like if I ended up in, uh, I don't know, what one of my friends ended, ended up having her beat as covering the shoe industry. And I'm not saying you can't have that in that industry too, but I just feel like I'm, I'm covering an industry where what I learn and what I write about really makes a difference in, in multiple people's lives. And maybe you do too when you're covering shoes. I don't know, but... <laughs> Uh, I, I just don't feel like I regret the field that I ended up in. Yeah, I, I guess it does add to the job satisfaction to know that there are so many other people who want to get a grasp on the thing that mm -hmm. you're learning. I, I, what, something else that you said that struck me is this idea of as you're reporting, as you're as you're researching, you're learning new things. Uh, something I've heard from from some friends who have been in the journalism business for a long time is some of them are in fields where there has not literally been nothing new for the last 30 years. It's the same stuff over and over again, and it's rehashed, and they can write the stories with their eyes closed. It's a living 
but they never come home and, and say, oh, well, I learned something new today. It was, oh, there was another release of blah, 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 and it's just like mm -hmm. the last release of blah, 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 but this one's going to make $5 billion. Um, I think that matters, right? I mean, is, is that what keeps yeah. you fresh, keeps you coming back for it? Yeah, definitely. I mean, uh, people who, uh, a lot of people say to me, wow, you only cover Microsoft. Like, that's your whole beat now. Isn't that boring? And everybody who says that to me, I said, do you know, like, the different fields that Microsoft spans? Like, in one day, I can write about everything from Windows to mobile devices to security to Xbox to CRM, um, health. I can write about almost any field because they are a company that spans every field. And I guess maybe if I was covering a company that was in one very narrow segment, I might feel kind of stymied by just being pegged into one beat or one company beat. But because they span so many things and because there's been so much change in the tech industry and in the places that they play, I never feel bored. I literally never feel bored. Let's talk a little bit about Microsoft, because obviously, as you said, that's that's your beat. That's what you do. You you mm -hmm. are all about Microsoft. And the funny thing is, before I even met you on the Twit TV network uh, years ago, um, I, I was doing a little bit of, uh, of tech work, a little bit of uh, journalism under a pen name. And people kept telling me, oh, you're working with Microsoft. You got to check out Mary Jo Foley. Uh, she, she she knows things before people in the company know about it. And, and then when I came here, I'm like, oh, my gosh, this is the Mary Jo Foley. Uh, but <laughs> but you are so synonymous with Microsoft. I mean, someone mm -hmm. mentions Microsoft and they'll say, oh, Mary Jo Foley, go see her. Someone says Mary Jo Foley, they go, oh, yeah, that's the woman who covers Microsoft. What What is it about Microsoft? What brought you in? What were your big stories? What were your big gets that said, yeah, this is the company I, I want to cover? Another case of uh, kind of where I ended up covering them by accident. So um, at the time I got hired by PC Week, which ultimately became eWeek in the industry, they hired me back then to cover Unix. So my beat at that time was covering Unix. I was the Unix reporter. So I covered Sun Microsystems and Digital Data General, like a lot of the companies that are no longer big deals um, in fact, may no longer exist. Uh, but while I was covering Unix for PC Week, their person who was the Microsoft reporter at the publication decided to leave. So there was this big panic, like, oh, man, who's going to become the Microsoft reporter? And nobody wanted to step up to the job because they knew it was kind of a big job. And finally, they said, you know what? Mary Jo, she covers operating systems. She covers Unix. Unix, Windows NT, kind of the same thing. So she's the Microsoft reporter. That's how I got the job. I just was like, yeah, you're the default choice. Um, so I, you know, years before that, I had interviewed Bill Gates. In fact, the very first time I interviewed him was in 1984, right after I started covering tech very, very early in my career. But then I kind of transitioned out of covering Microsoft and I was doing Unix and databases and a, a lot of different other things in between. Uh, so when I ended up taking Microsoft as my full-time beat at eWeek, it was definitely just kind of like, hey, nobody else wants us. Here you go. You're you're the Microsoft reporter now. And it was a really big time when, when that transition happened because it was before Windows 95. It was right when NT was starting to rise within the company and they had just done their first release of Windows NT. So I, I just kind of was at the right place in the right time and got to cover them as as they became more of a force in operating systems and other products. Okay, I, I'm, I'm going to get mean here. I'm going to get devil's advocate for a bit. I hope, hope you don't okay. mind. Uh, nope. There's always going to be people who say, okay, Mary Jo Foley is an intelligent woman. She obviously has chops. She obviously knows how to research. She obviously knows how to write. So why in God's good green earth would she choose to be associated with a company that is known mostly for bugs and defects and angry people. <laughs> uh, it, it, don't you, Mary Jo Foley, don't you know that Windows is a sinking boat? Why have you anchored yourself <laughs> to the sinking boat? You would bring up that story, wouldn't you, Padre? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was like one of my big like kind of breaks into into covering Microsoft when I I got my hands on a memo right after they launched Windows and uh, Windows 2000 where that said there are still 63,000 bugs left in Windows 2000, and um, it was meant to be. 
I believe, uh, kind of an inspirational memo to the team. Like, yeah, you guys, you did it. You came out with this operating system, but you know what? There's tons of things we didn't resolve. And I tried to write it to some degree that way to explain that was kind of the motivational factor behind, behind such a memo. But, um, yeah, a lot of people are like, wow, you're covering a company that's done a lot of harm to the industry with like patches and Internet Explorer and antitrust. They bring all these things up and it's like, how can you be in their corner? Well, I'm I'm of the old school that says if you're covering a company, you're not, quote, in their corner. Um, I, I, I'm not sure Microsoft still sees me um, as a friend. In fact, I would say... Many people and many teams at Microsoft see me as a foe even now. And I take pride in that because I'm not I'm not trying to hurt them or or make false accusations or anything like that. But my job as a journalist is to report what's going on, whether it's positive or negative, and try to present that in a balanced way. And and to me, in a way that helps customers and users and partners, especially, understand what's going on there and be able to use their products better. So my job isn't to be an advocate for Microsoft. It's just to explain what they're doing the best I can. Right, right. And I, I think that's actually a good place to be. You you don't want to be, yeah. you don't want to be antagonistic to a company, but at the same right. time, if you're friendly and if you start getting things like early yeah. access to product or early access to briefings that no one else gets, yeah. then it can be problematic. Uh, you know, I, I see that even from the blog, from the amateur blogger side, of saying, yeah. well, do, do I really want to re accept review product from this company if I know I'm going to give it a bad review? Or and th that's, That sort of integrity is, is something that I think we learn from the big guys, from the people who have done this job mm -hmm. for a long, long time. Mm -hmm. I, and also, and, I, and I, just because, I'm I was, was going to say, just because you get those briefings or early access, I don't think it necessarily means you're going to be a shill for the company, you know, um, I've been on both sides. I've been blacklisted sometimes by Microsoft and I've gotten early access sometimes and different teams have treated me differently. But I think the thing you have to remember is, you know, um, why ever they're giving you access or not giving you access, your job is still the same, which is to try to be fair and present products and strategies and an explanation of what they're doing as unbiasedly as you can without, you know, you know, not, not bringing an ax to grind, even when you're mad that they're blocking you or that um, they're giving somebody else precedence over you. It's tough. It's tough to do that. It's not human nature, but you got to try. I, I believe that uh, the best compliment we can give you is CR1 in the chat room is saying, Mary Jo Foley, you are dis a disgrace to Fox News. <laughs> Let's leave yes. it at that. <laughs> That's My work is done here. <laughs> <laughs> now, I, I will say, uh, us being on the same program together, I think that puts half of all the Twit hosts who really dog food Windows products, who use Windows <laughs> machines on a daily basis. I think we're, we're all now gathered in the same place, uh, which, okay, that tells you where we're coming from. Oh, <laughs> when we come back, I, I do, I do want to talk about beer because I promise you we're going to talk about beer, so we're going to talk okay. about beer. But before that, would you mind if we, uh, if we get into the tech a little bit? No, let's do it. All right. I, I thought that the, since you're on, we should probably talk about a review I recently did for a Windows notebook. Now, now, Mary Jo, both of us have Acer S7s, I believe. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I no. have one thanks to you, by the way. There we go. It's a wonderful. I I like it a lot. It's my daily driver. It's what I use. Me too. Uh, yep. But we, I think we have seen a shift in Windows machines over the last ten years. They, admittedly, they always took up the low range of pricing, right? It was the cheap right. Windows boxes. We've recently seen boxes that are not cheap, that are not inexpensive, but have been of varying quality. So uh, here we go. Take a look at the Toshiba W50. The Tekra W50 A1501 is Toshiba's new for 2014 enterprise class desktop replacement targeted at IT departments, power users, and executives. To be clear, this is a desktop replacement. It has a battery, but it's not designed to run away from the power outlet. It's a notebook, but it weighs 6 pounds and is up to 1.37 inches thick. It has a power adapter that weighs more than my Ultrabook. It's built for power and power alone. 
The W50 is powered by a fourth-generation Intel Haswell i7-4800MQ quad-core CPU with 6 megabytes of Intel Smart Cache, running at 2.70 GHz with a turbo frequency of 3.7 GHz. The CPU is supported by 16 GB of DDR3L system memory upgradable to 32 GB and an NVIDIA Quadro K2100M GPU with 2 GB of dedicated GDDR5. All that power drives the centerpiece of the W50, a 15.6-inch 16x9 LED backlit IGZO 4K Ultra HD display, capable of 3840x2160 and supporting 2160p content. The screen is beautiful. You could stare at it all day and not see a pixel. The colors are deep and rich with no discernible bleed through. In fact, the only issue I could find with the 4K screen was that it was a little dim compared with laptops with standard 1080p screens. Although specs sound fantastically impressive, the fastest mobile CPU you can shoehorn into a laptop, plenty of memory, powerful dedicated graphics, a monster screen that is beautiful, and with a street price of about $2,200, it's a decent purchase for power users. The question is, does the rest of the notebook measure up? First up, connectivity, and the W50 has it in spades. On the right side, you'll find a Kensington lock port, the comically large power port, gigabit ethernet, a media port, USB 3.0, and an express card slot. On the left side are audio, a smart card, an additional three USB 3.0 ports, with one of them doubling as an eSATA connector, VGA, and full-size HDMI. The front of the W50 houses a media card reader, and the underside hides a docking port. Toshiba equipped the W50 with Bluetooth 4.0, a dual-band 802.11a-b-g-n-ac Wi-Fi adapter, and a DVD Super Multi-Drive. The W50 has a full-size backlit keyboard with plenty of spacing, a dedicated numeric keypad and a standard multi-touch trackpad with a row of status LEDs just below, as well as an eraser head pointing device. So that's all the good stuff, and a lot of good stuff it is, but now to the rest. Primary storage on the W50 is a 7200 RPM hard drive. Not an SSD, not a hybrid, not a rotating drive with an SSD cache module, but a straight up hard drive. I don't understand the thought process of an engineer who thought to combine a high-power GPU and CPU, a load of memory, and a 4K display with a storage device that is slower than slow. It makes no sense, and Toshiba included a makes no sensometer in the LED that shows hard drive activity. If you're doing anything that requires even moderate storage usage, your experience will vacillate between awesome and and awesome and and awesome, and. Toshiba does include some decent software like an auto parking utility to prevent hard drive damage in a fall, but all those little pieces of bloatware conspire to keep the hard drive active all the time, and that just kills performance. Nowhere is that more clear than in benchmarking. The W50 scored a 9967 in PC Mark Vantage. That's well below the 13 and 14,000 that we've seen from Dell and HP desktop replacements. Though the W50 has more CPU and graphics power, the hard disk drive bottlenecks all that power. Unfortunately, it's not just the hard drive. The construction itself is questionable. The unit looks dirty, but there is way too much flex in the body panels. You'd think that Toshiba would throw in some brushed aluminum, magnesium, or even Gorilla Glass to stiffen the chassis and lid. In all, the W50 is a machine that has a lot of potential, but is crippled by some questionable component choices. The Toshiba W50 A1501 is available now with a three-year warranty. You can find it online for about $2250. Now, Mary Jo Foley, one of the interesting things about this notebook, I actually brought this up during the review. I, I, I'm doing something with it for know-how. It scored 9,600 or 9,900, 600, uh, 9,960 on uh, PC Mark Vantage. I dropped an SSD in here, just a run-of-the-mill Kingston KC300 SSD, and it jumped from 9,600 to 24,000 plus on PC Mark Vantage, <laughs> which, which is ridiculous because it's, it's one of these things when you look back at it, you start saying, what are you doing? Why would you do that? Why would you include all this awesome hardware and then cripple it with a hard drive? And I think the reason why I played this is I think this is kind of endemic of some PC manufacturers. Even though they're trying to make higher-end devices, 
they seem to be stuck in that whole we're gonna we're gonna sacrifice fifty nine percent of our performance for a three percent cost reduction. Uh, mm -hmm. Do you see that a lot? Is that still happening? Yeah, I know it's funny because I feel like different high end models of laptops and and PCs. You're kind of like, all right, what's the target market here? Because the specs are really different and. Um, what they're touting is really different. I mean, even with the Acer S7s, right? It, it was kind of like, okay, the monitor is really super crazy amazing. And it's like, all right, who is this machine for, right? <laughs> <laughs> so I, I don't know. I, I, feel like it, I feel like there's a lot of weird trade-offs that people have to wade through. And there's really nobody to, or, or no kind of uh, website or guide to wade them through it. You, you have to figure out what you need what's out there and kind of measure your needs against that without a lot of guidance. And that's, that's kind of tough. Right. But I, I think it puts a natural disadvantage to PCs over Macs, especially now since mm -hmm. they're basically going to be the same prices. Those high end machines yeah. are all competing yep. on price. Whereas, yep. you know, in a MacBook, they would never consider putting in one part that would cripple the entire machine. But we mm -hmm. see it all the time. I've seen it from Dell. I've seen it from Toshiba. I've seen it from HP. And that just, it, it grinds me because it's like, wait a minute. Whoa, mm -hmm. whoa, 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 whoa. You're not saving that much money. So yeah. are you doing this just to differentiate yourself between another, another product? Because if you're doing that, that's just stupid. I know. I mean, we do know margins are increasingly thin on all models of Windows PCs. Like, uh, you know, people talk about thin margins, but they're thinner than ever these days. So 3% savings, you know, to us, that seems like, wow, not not a whole lot. But maybe to them, that is something worth doing. I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. but I mean, consider that. So 2250 with the hard drive, it would be yeah. about 2300 with an SSD. And suddenly <laughs> yeah. it's close to three times the performance. Yeah. It just, You'd think it would at least be an option, right? <laughs> right. Right? Yeah. I mean, yeah, the W50 is not ord offered with an SSD. You can buy yeah. an SSD and install it. That's, I mean, actually, we're going to show people how to do that on this Thursday's episode of Know How. And, we're, and, nice. and if you don't believe me, we're actually going to show you the numbers this Thursday on Know How. And it, it just blew me away because it's one of these. Not only was it a hard drive, it was a slow hard drive that they put in there. So it's like, it was, it was as if they're saying, well, we don't just want to cripple it. We want to cripple it and make fun of its mom. And that's, that's what I saw. <laughs> Oh, man. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, well, Mary Jo Foley, let's let's step away from Microsoft. Let's step away from computers. Let's step away from okay. from the the super digital tech side because there is one thing I really really wanted to talk to you about today, and that's beer. Can we talk beer? Yeah, let's talk beer. Okay, you're kind of passionate about beer. I don't drink. I've never drank beer. I just don't like the flavor of beer. So. Maybe mm. you can help guide me into the path of the brood righteousness. Does this sound like uh, like a go? <laughs> Let's try. Let's try. <laughs> okay. So uh, I, I found the history of beer absolutely fascinating. We know from archaeological evidence that beer came from about 9500 BC. That's, that's as far back as that we've seen uh, evidence of the fermentation process. Now, there are some people, and I love this, there are some archaeologists who claim, I'm not sure if I believe it, but they, they kind of have a, a decent point that beer is the reason for society, that society would not exist in its current form if it were not for beer. It, it, follow me on this one. So we go from, from beer, accidental beer, just fermented cereal, to the desire to have something more consistent. So you have to farm. If you're going to farm, you have to have tools. If you're going to have tools, you get irrigation. If you irrigate, it leads to permanent settlement. And if you have a per permanent settlement, it leads to civilization. So do you believe that beer is the reason for society? Yeah, I, I buy that. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. All right. Let, let's get past the history a little bit. Uh, you know, quite simply, beer, as we know, is uh, it comes from the alcoholic fermentation of sugar, uh, and that sugar can be in a lot of different materials. But I want to talk specifically about a typical, uh, a type of brewing that has become popular around the world, and that's craft brewing. What What is craft brewing? Oh, uh, man. That, you know, it's a very amorphous uh, definition as to what constitutes a craft brewery versus non-craft. And, and it's a big topic of debate among people who like craft beer. You know, there are people who say, Sam Adams, 
Yeah, maybe technically they're a craft beer brewery, but they're too big now, so they shouldn't count. So part of the definition revolves around size. Uh, part of it revolves around are you an independent brewery or not? Um, and, you know, once a big, uh, large multinational brewer like Anheuser-Busch buys you, like they just bought uh, Goose Island and they bought another brewery, uh, brewery here in New York called Blue Point, are you still a craft brewery? Even if they let you alone and kind of let you do your own thing, are you, are you now a craft brewery still or not? So it, it's a real hot topic among people and people get really incensed when you call some somebody a craft brewer who they don't think constitutes a craft brewer. So I, I don't know. The definition is very um, kind of a morphing definition that doesn't have real strict boundaries in my view. All right, right. The the Brewers Association, which uh, I I actually did meet with so, uh, someone from the Brewers Association, was at CES. I'm not sure why mm. they were at CES, mm. but uh, he really wanted to tell me about his industry, and I, I found it fascinating. He was telling me that the craft brewery industry, as we know it, started back in 1979 when Jimmy Carter signed a bill that made it easier for small ventures to make their own breweries. <clears throat> Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, I think the numbers he was saying was, oh, actually, I, I've, got a, I've got a screen for this. The numbers he was saying was that back in 1979, there were 89 breweries. And today, there's a toll of, what, 2,822, uh, which, again, just kind of pales in comparison to what we had back 140 years ago, where we had over 4,000 of these, of these microbreweries or craft breweries. But uh, back to the Brewers Association, like you said, uh, they say it has to be fewer than six billion, uh, six million, six billion, six mm -hmm. million barrels of beer a year. Uh, they have to be seventy-five percent owned or controlled by a craft brewer, and they have to have at least fifty percent of the beer's volume consisting of what they called traditional or innovative ingredients. And I think, uh, stop me if I'm wrong. I think what that means is it it can't be like a, a brewery that just dumps uh, Bud Light. Into, into a keg. <laughs> it has to be something that's that's unique and that you can't find someplace else. Uh, is, is, is that your understanding? Yeah, I, I would guess so. Um, the, the unique ingredients part is tough because, you know, most beer is just the basic same few ingredients, the malt, the yeast, the water, you know. Um, so it's it's kind of hard to say what's what constitutes a unique ingredient. I mean, different brewers put kind of weird things into their beer like coconut or whatever but um i don't think that's part of the definition of being a craft brewery or craft beer can we, can we talk about that because uh, i i have beer drinking friends who do nothing but make fun of sam adams holiday brews they say cranberries should never be nowhere near beers nuts should be nowhere near beers but isn't that the whole idea i mean that's what a craft brewer does right you put weird things in and you get something that didn't <laughs> exist before yeah, I, I'm a I'm a big experimenter. So I I've been doing a little bit of home brewing for the past couple of years, and I'm big on trying very unusual ingredients in my beer. But you know, the a lot of the most famous and and best received craft beers they don't have the weird ingredients in them. They're just the basic hops, yeast, malt, and water. That's it. And they just know how to tweak them and put them in the correct proportions, use the correct kinds of malt or yeast, and they and they create things that are very different and unique without putting anything like nuts or whatever into their beers. But wait, if, I like, if, I like both. <laughs> if it's nothing, if it's, if it's nothing original, then it's not a craft beer, right? I mean, it's just, it's just yeah. a small brewery. It's, it still counts as a craft beer. I mean, if you just make a very basic IPA with just the most basic ingredients and you're a small brewer and you're doing it, you know, in an independent way in your own facility, you're still a craft beer, even if you don't put anything like fennel into your beer. You're st you still count. <laughs> okay, Mary Jo, I, I'm a geek. I'm a techie. So if you could, I, I understand generally the process for, for making beer. You start off with mm -hmm. some sort of stock, uh, normally barley. Yep. You allow it to be fermented. The fermentation process turns the sugars into carbon dioxide and alcohol. Uh, and then you have some sort of refinement and you drink it, right? But I mean, obviously, <laughs> yep. it's more complicated than that. You actually do brew beer. Tell me what you do. Okay. So uh, I should qualify this by saying I brew really, really small batches of beer. Like mo most home brewers 
do like five gallons to 10 gallons at a time so they can make multiple bottles. So I brew one gallon at a time. Like I'm going to show you what I brew in. This <laughs> is the size of the beer I brew. Whoa. This is a one gallon carboy. <laughs> That's like a full so, on wash tub symphony beer bottle. Yeah. So it's it's pretty small. This is this makes about six to seven bottles of beer. And that's all I brew at one time because I don't really have the room to brew five or ten gallons of beer at a time. Um, it takes a lot of space. You need a really big pot if you're brewing big and you need to be able to cool it. So you need a big kind of chiller or a big place to to throw your big pot into and cool it way down. So, yeah, I, I only do a small batch at a time. And I'll tell you one of my secrets as a small batch brewer. Ooh, okay, wait. Um, no, I love secrets. Okay. So this was uh, shared with me by somebody else in New York City who does small batches. See this weird thing? It's a bag. Um, it's the kind of bag that people who uh, are mixing paint use to mix paint. And the person told me if I took this bag and, I, and when I'm brewing, poured all my grains into there before I started boiling them and just dropped this bag into the pot with all the grains in it, it would make my life so much easier in terms of keeping it clean and being able to strain it and all. And I think a lot of people who do small batches don't know about this, but if you look up on the web, brewing in a bag, this is what you do. You brew in a bag. Wait, wait what is that? What's just a plastic bag? What? Wait, so it's what does it a, let you do? It's a mesh bag, and when you put the grain in there, it, it keeps it more, like, self-contained. Because if you don't have the bag, you're throwing the malt into the pot, and then you have to pour it into a strainer, and sometimes the malt falls into the strainer, and it gets to be a big mess when you're trying to uh, pour the hot water over it to make sure the grains are all, um, what do they call that, kind of uh, soaked in the boiling water. So... I just do it in the bag and, and you drop the whole bag with everything that you're going to boil right into the pot. And then when you pull it out, everything's in the bag. So it's it's an easy cleanup, easy way to uh, make sure you don't lose a lot of the really good cooking liquid that you cook down, which is what makes the beer, the wort. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's a nice little secret if you're doing home brewing and you're doing it in a small batch. So wait, you, you you distill the stuff towards the end, right? I mean, after you get the, yeah. the fermentation. And So what do you do to stop the fermentation? Yeah. So um, after you boil, well, I'll show you. Um, yes. I have some props here. <laughs> These are uh, bags of malt. Like this is a, a light, like a Pilsner malt that you might use in a beer. This is a dark chocolate malt. What makes a dark beer dark? Um, and so you boil those in water and, and towards the end of the brewing, you add the hops and I use hop pellets that look like rabbit food, kind of, I don't know if you can see these, but they're like little grains that look like little rabbit oh, food. Oh, okay. <laughs> Back up total, total noob question here. What's the difference between <laughs> the malt and the hops? So the hops are, are a plant. They're actually like a, a, co a cone shaped, uh, plant flower on a plant, that's what makes beer bitter. It, it's a bittering agent. It's a flavoring agent. And it's what people used to do and use in the olden olden days um, to make sure their beer didn't spoil. So, you know, when, when you smell oh. beer and you're like, wow, that smells really strong or bitter or hoppy, that's, that's hops are what make beer hoppy, not okay. surprisingly. Okay, that makes sense. <laughs> and there's all different kinds. There's aromatic hops and bittering hops. Like in my freezer right now, I have tons of bags of pellets, all labeled, all different kinds of hops. Like if somebody came and looked at my freezer, they'd be like, wow, what is that? Like, it's just a whole bunch of different kinds. I have like Will Willamette hops and Chinook and Amarillo hops. And so I, I kind of know after having brewed a few batches and read some things about which, which kind of hops imbue a certain flavor or taste into a beer. Right. I, I have a friend, a, a Jesuit brother, actually, who uh, who does make his own brew. He, he's mm -hmm. a little microbrewery in the basement, and it does look like a still, which is strange. I yeah. didn't <laughs> it would actually look like that. But uh, he told me uh, he can't use the house water. He, I remember he's saying the water is the mm -hmm. most important thing that you'll put into your beer. Mm -hmm. Was he just messing with me? Nope. Oh, That's the really? truth. That's the truth. Yeah. Um, just, you know, how... Uh, I don't know if you've ever heard this, like what makes a New York bagel a really great bagel is the water. 
Um, oh. Like people think, oh, New York City, your water must be horrible. But we actually have really awesome water for making bagels and for brewing beer. We don't need to put anything in our water. It's just really great for, for those tasks. Um, but other places where people brew beer, they have to add certain kinds of minerals to the water to make it so that it's more suited to make, to making beer. Like their water is either too hard or too soft. It's not the correct kind of water. Here, you can just use a water straight out of the tap and it works fine. Wow. Yeah, because he, he has, let's see, he has a couple of things on his shelf. He has a box of gypsum which I, mm -hmm. I don't know what you use that for. That's for the water. He yep. has <laughs> he has like Alhambra bottles that he, he trucked from 50 miles away of a certain type of well water. He says he wow. uses that for stouts. And then he has uh, like a soft water treater that he says he uses for pilsners. Does th wow. that actually makes a difference? I mean, the water itself will determine what kind of beer you get? It doesn't really determine the kind of beer, but it definitely determines the quality of the beer and... Uh, just be, because beer has so few ingredients, I mean, at the essence, it's hops, water, yeast, and the grains. And, you know, when you're down to those four things, they have to be of the highest quality in the right proportions, or it's just not going to work. Got it. Okay. Now, let's share the uh, secrets of the brewing master here. You, you've shared <laughs> the uh, the sorting bag, the, the mesh mm -hmm. bag, the paint bag. Yep. Uh, you've shared the type of ingredients that you use. Now, you know, you've told us a little bit about water, which, by the way, I... I had no idea that was actually true. I really thought mm -hmm. he was just messing with me. If someone wanted to get into brewing beer, and I actually want to do it. I, I don't drink beer, but I love the idea of making it. Mm -hmm. What is the bare minimum? What do you have to have? Because I, you know, I look around and I, I see these kits that you can buy, and they cost thousands yeah. of dollars. And I'm thinking, mm -hmm. you know what? No, I, I think I know people who know how to make this with gear you may just have lying around your house. So if yep. I wanted to become a brewer, what would I need and what would I have to do? Okay. So I'm going to, I'm going to tell a company that I'm not doing this because I know anybody there or have any uh, vested interest in this. But when I um, started homebrewing, my sister sent me a homebrewing kit from a company called um, Brooklyn Brew Shop. Here's their book. This is like my Bible. This is, this literally is like on my table behind me and uh, it tells you how to brew beer in one gallon containers. And when you buy the kit, it costs like 50 bucks. You get the, the bottle, that glass bottle I just showed you, you get the grains and the hops to make your first one gallon batch. You get a thing called an airlock, which is this little contraption here. Um, you stick it into the top of the container so that when your beer is, um, is fermenting air can escape and it doesn't explode um you get this other weird contraption called a racking cane which is this thing Wait, and this is to like you pump it and you have a piece of just a um plastic tubing attached and it's how you transfer the beer from your carboy into the bottles it's okay. very manual for low, low tech so this whole thing can cost you 50 bucks unless you happen to have some of these parts hanging around your house. Um, but it's a pretty small investment if you want to just kick the tires and see, hey, do I like brewing beer? I like it. And again, I don't drink beer, but I'm fascinated by the ability to brew it. Mm -hmm. Mary Jo Foley, I want to thank you so very much for being on Padre's Corner. I, I know it's late and I know that you have to get up early. You're a morning person. I'm mm -hmm. not. But uh, I, again, thank you so very much. It's always a pleasure to speak with you. Uh, I'll, I'll get a chance again. I'm, I'm going to sub in for Leo for uh, Windows Weekly towards the end of the month. So uh, hopefully oh, nice. by then I will have tried my hand at brewing the perfect brew. If I think you're going to be exists. good at it. All you have to be is, is just very, um, you have to be very clean like a, a big thing that people talk about with brewing is you have to sanitize a lot. So if you're clean and you're kind of an OCD, like very exacting type person and a person who likes cooking, I think, I think you're going to be successful. Fantastic. And could you please tell the folks at home where they can find you? I know they can find you all over the internet. They, they definitely can find you on Twitter if they just go to uh, Mary Jo Foley. That's, that's a really hard Twitter name to remember. But uh, <laughs> where, where else can they find you if, uh, if they want to find your work, if they want to find what you're doing? Yep. Uh, yep. So Twitter, all, uh, at Mary Jo Foley. Uh, my blog is at allaboutmicrosoft.com, uh, where I, I blog pretty much daily. It's on the ZD Net Network. 
I'm on Windows Weekly every Wednesday, 2 p.m. Eastern with Paul Thorat and Leo. And I also do a column um, in Redmond Magazine, redmondmag.com, uh, once a month where I talk about Microsoft as well. So I'm around. You guys can find me. <laughs> Thank you. That's fantastic. <laughs> Again, thank you very much for staying up past, way past your bedtime. Uh, it's, <laughs> it's been an absolute pleasure. Ladies and gentlemen, Mary Jo Foley, the, uh, the woman, the myth, the legend. <laughs> wow. I, that's tough to live up to. And thanks for having me on. Oh, and the other place I didn't say people can find me, but you know, Padre is at Rattle and Hum. Of course. In, Ma in Manhattan. Of course. Local, my local pub. Uh, and uh, you'll, you'll be there pouring a stout. Of course. Yes, that's, that's what you do. Again, uh, you take care. Have a good night. And uh, we'll see you the next time you come in for Padre's Corner. Thank you. Now, folks, this is the end of this episode of Padre's Corner. But this is not the end of where you can find me on the Twit TV network. If, uh, if you really want to, you can find me for This Week in Enterprise Tech on Mondays at 2.30 Pacific Time. We get to talk about data centers, about networking, and about how the world is connected. You can find me here Tuesdays at 7.30 p.m. Pacific Time for Padres Corner, where we just do this. We geek out to topics that I think you might want to hear about. On Thursdays, you're going to find me twice, once at 11 o'clock a.m. with Brian Burnett for Know How. We're going to take you through some DIY projects, some, some maker stuff, including maybe we'll be brewing some beer in the near future. And at 1.30, you'll find me with Shannon Moore Snubs for Coding 101. I'll let you into the wonderful world of the code monkey. If you want to find Padre's Corner in any of its forms, go ahead and jump over to twit.tv. You'll find our uh, our little uh, page at twit.tv slash Padre. There you'll find all of our episodes. We, by the way, we only have four right now, including this one, and our show notes. If you want to find out about the individual segments that we play during the show, you'll find them there. And if you want to subscribe so that you get every episode of Padre's Corner into your box automatically, we make it easy for you to do that. While you're subscribing, why not follow me on Twitter? If you go to twitter.com slash Padre SJ, you'll find uh, what, what I do during the day. When I'm not at Twit, when I'm not being Padre SJ on Twit TV, you'll, uh, you'll see what Padre does in his time off. Finally, I want to thank everyone here who makes this show possible, to Leo and Lisa for letting me take over the airwaves, to the chat room for being just a wonderful group of uh, geeks, guys, gals, trolls, and engineers, uh, the best group you really can have, and of course, to, uh, to you, to the loyal listener, the viewer, the watcher, who lets us do this each and every single week. Until next time, I'm Father Robert Balasser, the digital Jesuit. This has been Padre's Corner. Geek out.